Join me for the mid-season finale of Quarantined with Lavelle. This will be the last new episode until August. And we are going to be diving into June's Defense Thursday's topic, How Did We Get the Bible? Last month, we talked about how we can know that the Bible is really the Word of God. Well, this month, we're going to be talking about how we got the Bible with topics such as how did we get the Old and New Testament, the canon of Scripture, the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we have two very special guests joining me to help deal with this amazing and informative topic. Elder Michael Holloway from Elder Mike, Your Urban Church YouTube channel, and Minister Desmond Ingram of Christ Jesus TV YouTube channel. You don't want to miss this episode. So tune in and join us on Thursday, June 24th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Kneel Down Productions Facebook group page as well as the Kneel Down Productions YouTube channel. You don't want to miss this amazing and informative episode. So tune in, spread the word, and we'll see you on the show. What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Quarantined with Lavelle. That's right, we are excited. This is our Defense Thursdays for June, and we're going to be dealing with the topic of how did we get the Bible? Now, listen, I have two of my brothers that are going to be in studio with me. Uh, we pre-recorded this episode, so we're going to watch this and we are going to enjoy. But I'm going to stay on live. So if you have any questions or whatever, go ahead and shoot them toward me. Uh, ask them and I'll try to post them and I'll try my best to answer them. If I can't, then on the replay, I'll make sure that that uh, Elder Mike and Minister Dez uh, come back and answer any questions that you may have. Again, we appreciate you tuning in. Let's talk to God right now. Father, we thank you so much for this day, for choosing us to be a part of this day. We ask you to have your way with this broadcast. We give it over to you. Lord, we ask that you remove any type of uh, technical difficulties or whatnot and just let everything flow smoothly in the name of Jesus. Let your people be edified and equipped for ministry have your way in jesus name amen and amen listen we truly appreciate you and we just ask that you hit that share button hit that share button let people know what's going on because we are going to have a good time with this topic how did we get the bible if you're watching on youtube go ahead and hit that thumbs up button let us know that you're watching they have a thumbs up button uh on youtube let me see here 
Uh, we got a few people watching. Um, so if you're watching it, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button to let us know that you're watching. If you're watching on Facebook, hit that thumbs up button on Facebook as well so that we'll know that you're watching. Remember, remember you can make comments or whatnot. Uh, we appreciate any comments that you may make. So join in on the discussion and on the conversation because we are excited. Also, if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and hit that share button, the, the thumbs up button and the share button so that we can get the word out. All right, listen. We're going to prepare to jump on in, but as we already stated, this is our mid-season finale. So I'm going to come back at the end and give a little more details, but this is the last show until the first Thursday of August. So we're taking the month of July off. But listen, we're not taking the month of July off to rest. We're actually revamping some things and trying to get some more guests for the show. You will not believe how difficult it is getting uh, topics and guests for the show because we want to make sure that all of the topics we deal with are relevant to you, the audience. What do you want to hear about? You can inbox me or write on the Kneel Down Productions uh, uh, Facebook group wall or even on YouTube. What are some of the topics that in the future you would like to see us deal with? So make sure, make sure that you uh, join us for that. And of course, I have to give my shout outs, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost, for blessing us with this platform. And we want to use this platform to the glory of God. Next, I have to give a shout out to my lovely, amazing wife, Lakinya, my son, Emmanuel, who just turned 10 months old. That's right. Uh, on, the, on Father's Day, he turned 10 months old. Amen. So. Listen, we truly thank God for him. Shout out to my mother, amen, to my mother in love, to my Auntie Linda, my Uncle Neil, um, and, and, and all of the audience, everyone who is watching, those of you who are faithful watchers of the show, we do just ask that you hit that share button so that we can get the word out. Listen, I'm not going to prolong this any longer. We're going to jump right in with the topic, how did we get the Bible. Remember, last month on Defense Thursdays, we dealt with how we, how we dealt with how can we know that the Bible is actually the Word of God, right? So this month, go back and watch that May's episode, May's uh, edition of Defense Thursdays. But for June, we're dealing with the topic: How did we get the Bible? Did God write the Bible? Did man write the Bible? If man wrote the Bible, you know. It, is it reliable? Can we trust the words of man, right? We're going to deal with all of that. And, of course, I told you I have my two brothers, Elder Mike Holloway, Minister Desmond Ingram. And I'm telling you, I was completely blessed by this study, and I truly believe that you will too. Again, hit that share button as we jump on into Defense Thursdays for the month of June. How did we get the Bible? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Quarantined with Lavelle. And as stated before, we are in our June version of Defense Thursdays. Go back if you get a chance to watch May's version where I was talking about how do we know that the Bible is the word of God. We went over the manuscript evidence. We went over the archaeological evidence. We went over the uh, prophetic accuracy of the Bible. We went over the science of statistical probability and statistics. And, and I, I think it was really, really good. So please go back and watch that episode. But for this episode, I had to bring some help in. I had to call on my brothers because today's topic is how did we get the Bible? You know, many people may think that God wrote the Bible, right? So we're going to get an understanding. How did we actually get the Bible? So I had to call on two of my brothers in the Lord, mighty men of God. So we are going to have Elder Michael Holloway. You all are familiar with Elder Holloway. He's been on the show several times. Um, his YouTube channel is Elder Mike, Your Urban Church. And also we have Minister Desmond Ingram. Amen. So we are excited about having both of them on the show. So I'm going to bring them on, let them tell you a little bit about themselves, and then we're going to dive into this topic. First of all, my big brother in the Lord that I've been knowing for probably, what, 12, 13 years, Elder Mike Holloway. Elder, welcome to the show. 
Oh, uh, you're on mute, Elder. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, no thank, problem. Thank you, Elder. Appreciate you, my friend. Thank you for inviting me back to the show. God bless all of your uh, viewers. Uh, we're just excited about this topic. It's a, it's a great one. So uh, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Awesome. 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 Now, this next young man, I actually met him through you, through following you. And I have I have been following him, watching his uh, YouTube videos and watching his Facebook posts. And he is truly a mighty young man of God. So, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome my brother in the Lord, Minister Desmond Ingram. God bless you, Minister Des. Hey, God bless you, brothers. Uh, once again, thank you for having me on. Been looking forward to this the uh, past couple, I think, past couple months, actually. We've been trying yeah. to set this up. So uh, blessings to the audience and blessings to you guys as well. Thank you so much, man. Listen, so I, I, let me let me kind of say this. So I just met uh, you, Minister Des, this, this year. And uh, I appreciate you and everything that you stand for. Oh, let me put this information up now because I want to make sure that people follow your YouTube channel. Minister Desmond Ingram is on YouTube and his YouTube channel is Christ Jesus TV. So just go to YouTube, uh, type in Christ Jesus TV and make sure you follow his YouTube channel. And of course, Elder Mike Holloway is Elder Mike, your urban church on youtube so make sure you follow these two amazing amazing brothers in the lord so let me let me start off by saying this now elder elder mike a lot of people may not know this about you but mm -hmm. you are you know you're a husband of course you're a father you're a minister you're an apologist you're a defender of the faith you're a a, a, a sports fan you are a lot of things but what a lot of people don't know and this was actually how i met you you're also a musician and a producer. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that's how I met you. We were doing um, Eric Walker's play, right. uh, The Call Center, and that was how I met you. We spent many nights rehearsing music at your house and you yes. trying to get me on key. <laughs> now, I didn't have to work hard. This brother is gifted. Doc Lavelle is a, a, a definite gift to the body of Christ. But but absolutely, you know, I um, I haven't done a lot of music lately. I've, been, I've kind of more so focused in in the apologetics arena. But you're absolutely right. I still got my studio and you've been to my house. You saw my, I still got my sound booth uh, yes, and all the keyboards and everything. Uh, so thank God all my sons are musicians so they can take it to the next level. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you, you laid a wonderful foundation. Bless Amen. So, so, Elder Mike, why don't you just briefly just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll have Minister Dez tell us a little about himself, and then we'll jump on into the topic. Sure. As stated, I am Elder Mike Holloway. I am an associate pastor of Power, Hope, and Grace Bible Church. Well, my pastor is the wonderful bishop, uh, the Dr. Quentin W. Wingate, a yes. wonderful man of God who, who loves truth, loves the word of God, loves uh, the Bible, <laughs> and we're going to get it straight. Uh, right from the Bible. So I thank God for him. We're located in Detroit, Michigan. And so uh, we're grateful for being a part of that ministry. I am the husband of one wife uh, and her name is Sister Belinda yes. <laughs> Holloway <laughs> and my yeah. wonderful wife. And, uh, and I have three sons, three sons, Marcel, Mike Jr. and Kendall. And uh, Marcel is 30. Kendall. Wow. Yes, that means, you know, I'm 40, but he's, no, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he's, he's 30 uh, this, uh, this year he turned 30. Uh, and then Mike is 25 and Kendall is, is 24. And uh, God has just been faithful and been good, man. And uh, we love the word of God. We love, you all know that I love apologetics. You know, we, we're in the fire. We're, we're, we're going against uh, cultic doctrine, specifically many who hold uh, some of the tenets of the Hebrew Israelite doctrine. Uh, you know, we, we just make it our business to, to help people come out of false doctrine. You want to know why? I was in false doctrine. So God mm -hmm. helped me to come out. So with his help, we're going to do what we can to help others come out. So I appreciate the platform, Brother Lavelle, Elder Lavelle. We thank you so much for inviting us. Amen. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, my brother, Dez, Minister Dez Ingram, tell us a little bit about yourself, my brother. 
Uh, Des Ingram. Uh, I'm a minister at Christian Bethel Church in Ecorse, Michigan, under uh, Pastor Roberto Flores. Uh, you know, we're a small church, small church in the city, in the hood, as they would say. Uh, but, you know, we're all about trying to equip people with the truth, the, the truth of Christ, uh, whether that is in apologetics or just being in the outreach of evangelism. Uh, you know, I have a wife, my wife, Sierra, been married for seven years. It'll be eight years in September. I had to make sure I get that date right because she, was, she watches this. I would get that wrong. I'll be sitting on the couch. All right. I'll be, I'll be at one of y'all house. Okay. All right. uh, uh, but, you know, I have a son named Jaden. I'm also enrolled at uh, Moody Theological Seminary. I do undergrad work uh, for uh, biblical studies. So, uh, you know, I just love the Lord. I'm not the knife, uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, you know, I, I look at you guys, so you uh, both Elder Lavelle and Elder Mike as, uh, you know, heavyweights in the faith and just doing things to continue to equip brothers, young brothers like me and the Lord to continue to go hard and have knowledge. So um, once again, just thank you for inviting me on. Hey, man, my absolute pleasure, my brother. Hey, man. All right, listen, so normally, you know, I, I, I know this topic, we could drag this on for hours and hours. So I don't want this to be a three hour uh, uh, episode here. So we're going to jump right on in. So the topic is how did we get the Bible? So before we jump in with the first question, which the first question is, how did we get the Old Testament? We're going to talk to Elder Mike about that. But before we do, I just want to get some terms uh, uh, set out and laid out here, Elder. So number one, it's, it's three, three things. I want three things. Number one, the Bible is inspired. The Bible is Absolutely. inspired, which means that it's God breathed, right? That God bore them along. OK, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. number two, the Bible is infallible and inerrant. Now, infallible means unable to deceive and mm -hmm. inerrant, of course, means without error. So the Bible does not deceive us. And there is no error in the original autographs. We talked a little bit about that last month, and we could talk, touch, touch on that. And then number three, the Bible is sufficient. I wrote this little note here. Scripture provides what we need to, what we need to know God. Not everything there is to know about God, but everything that we need to know about God. And through the manuscripts, we talked about this last month, through the manuscript evidence, it has been sufficiently preserved. So, Absolutely. Elder Mike, just for a brief second, talk a little bit about this inspiration thing. Now, I was inspired to write the play Issues of Blood. So is that scripture? <laughs> I was, in, I was inspired, right? <laughs> yes, sir. And it was a powerful play at that. But, oh. but no, it was it, as powerful as it was, <laughs> it was not a, a scripture. We can be inspired from the standpoint of being uh, encouraged uh, to do something for the kingdom of God. But when it comes to the inspiration of scripture, as you brought out, this means that this is God breathed. God, though he uses human instrumentation through an inspiration, right? This type of revelation only comes from God, right? I'm actually, with the help of the Lord, you all pray, I'm working on a book right now. Yes. And I wanted to Amen. I, wanted, Amen. I wanted to be an encouragement, but it's not inspired scripture. You know, mm -hmm. it's not inspired scripture. Inspiration that comes from God, we believe, and we can I know we'll kind of get into it uh when we talk about the canon or the authority authority of the scriptures, we believe that to be closed, right? Mm -hmm. There there is no more uh, adding to the books of the Bible, the inspiration that comes from God, where we get our complete Bible. That has been completed through God, through the apostles and those associated with them and the law and the prophets and, and so on. Amen. Amen. I, there are several quotes from several church fathers dealing with the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture. We may yeah. get into a little bit of that, but I want to read this quote. And um, it's from Dr. Timothy Paul Jones, who wrote a phenomenal book called How We Got the Bible. And this is what he says. He said, the Bible is inerrant and infallible in its inspiration. It is sufficient in its preservation, but it's dependent on interpretation. I'll add proper interpretation and yeah. illumination for its application in our lives. I thought that was a really good that is. quote. The Bible is inerrant and infallible in its inspiration. Mm -hmm. It's sufficient in its preservation 
but it's dependent on proper interpretation and illumination for its application in our lives. What, what do you think about that, yeah. Minister Diaz? Does that kind of I like sum it. That, um, that sums it up. And I, I love the fact that how, uh, what was the author's name again? Uh, Dr. Timothy Paul Jones. I like how Dr. Uh, Jones put that, especially when he uh, got the point with uh, revelation and also illumination, because a lot of times people will say, and, and I don't think people do it on purpose, because uh, I used to say these things were like, man, I, got, I, just, I just got revelation when I was reading this word. It's like, no, actually, <laughs> you're getting uh, illumination. You know, uh, right. God, uh, by the Holy Spirit, is um, uh, highlighting some things uh, according to his word. Uh, but he's not giving a revelation anymore. We don't see that. I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, how God gives revelation to the prophets, the apostles, or someone close to the apostles or prophets um, of old. But we don't see that anymore. So I, I like how he highlighted that. So that's, that's, that's really good stuff with that quote. Amen. Amen. All right, brothers, let's jump on in. I got a list of questions here and we're just kind of got to go on through these questions. So Elder Mike, I know this is a broad <laughs> question, but if you can just kind of give us a, a little bit of history on how did we get the Old Testament? So the topic tonight is how did we get the Bible? But the Bible is in two parts, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. How did we get the old covenant? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And as you said, it's broad. We could we could probably do, you know, a <laughs> nine month series on this question alone. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, but, you know, just to encapsulate, you know, first and foremost, the Old Testament was, was written between 1500 B.C. and 400 B.C. Right. Mm -hmm. Moses, God had told Moses to write in the in a book. And you'll see this throughout the book of Exodus, Exodus 17, Exodus 34, Exodus chapter number 30. God is instructing Moses to write these things down, write the law, you know. Uh, and then over the next 1100 years, other writers such as Samuel, right, such as Ezra, Nehemiah and other Old Testament authors begin to write who were also as the term that Brother Lavelle brought out already that God inspired. In other words, he not not just illumination as, as Brother Des was talking about, but he he solely inspired them to write his sacred word. And how did they write? Because a lot of times, and, and again, which is why I think this is such a powerful topic, people push back on the Bible mm. because they, they want to know how, you know, how was the Bible preserved and how do we know we have the right Bible? Well, they wrote, they actually wrote these things down. Right. They wrote on clay. They wrote on stone. Uh, many of them wrote on papyrus or uh, some type of uh, leather or animal skins. This is how they uh, carried out the writing of the inspired word of God. Today, we have uh, found certain fragments, uh, certain things written on stone that help to corroborate the fact that we are believing the right. Uh, were as it pertains to the Old Testament. And now, let me just say this real, and I, and I, I don't, I know this can be <laughs> drug out, but, but the Old Testament was finished about 400 years before Jesus came on the scene. Mm -hmm. And so the Old Testament being written in Hebrew and Hebrew being a pictorial language, anybody who, you know, kind of doing any research on the Hebrew language, you'll find the Hebrew is pictorial, meaning that not only did the words communicate verbally, what God said, but the Hebrew language itself paints the picture, which was very important in their culture because remember, they didn't have Kinko's that they can go make copies of the Bible. You know what right. I'm saying? I couldn't say, hey, email me a copy of this, uh, that script you wrote last night, uh, David. Right. No, you know what I mean? Right. So, but what they had to do is they wrote it in such a way where it would be heard and it would be remembered, which is why Hebrew was pictorial. And you all know they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, there's some truth to that. It's not scripture, but it's some truth to it in that the way the Hebrew was uh, uh, communicated, it was a it was written in a way for them to grasp it, memorize it, and yeah. understand it and apply it. So, you know, long story short, these things were preserved. People like Ezra, some people say about uh, 500 years before Christ, Ezra. Ezra 
compiled some of these manuscripts together. Uh, and this is Jewish history. Ezra, as well as perhaps Nehemiah with Ezra, compiled some of these manuscripts together, which were preserved. And we have what is called the Masoretic Text, that, uh, where, where they actually copied these things down. And uh, we'll, I know we're going to kind of get into the Dead Sea Scrolls a little bit later, but, but that Masoretic text is really the, the most common used version. Like in your King James Version, when you read the Old Testament, that was translated into English from the Hebrew and or Aramaic. We got a little Aramaic uh, Masoretic text. And so through the authentication of those who were actually there and wrote and the preservation of these writings throughout church history provide us, and there are other things as well we'll get into, but these things in a nutshell, they basically provide us with the confidence that we can have that when we pick up our Bible, we are in fact reading God's word. This isn't something that some guy came up with. No, we are in fact reading the preserved word of God. Amen. So, like, when you have a, a, a gentleman like Bart Ehrman, who's a, a mm -hmm. very famous skeptic, um, he's an, he, he calls himself an agnostic, but he's really an atheist. But when you have a Bart Ehrman who kind of, and, and I read a quote that, that he likened the writing of scripture with the telephone game. I don't know. Do you remember the telephone game where you have yes. a, a okay. circle of students all lined up and you will whisper a sentence in one of their ear and they have to whisper it to the next one. And by the time it gets all the way back, the entire sentence has changed. You know, mm -hmm. you might start off saying the sky is blue today and end up with the ocean is purple or so, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, so, so is that a legitimate argument against the way we got the Bible, the way we got the old Testament? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the defenses or one of the things that we can solely put our faith in is the fact that we've got here's a book. And we, you know, the Bible itself was written over sixteen hundred years. Mm -hmm. But when we read Genesis and then we read, remember, there's over 40, over 40 writers that, that wrote the Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was written over three continents over these 15 1600 years mm -hmm. and the consistency of the message is unparalleled with any other writing in antiquity you won't find this kind of consistency so you got and, and remember they they all couldn't go look pull it up in the cloud to see you know let me look up and see what samuel wrote no they didn't have these copies right. but the consistency that god showed through the preservation of scripture i mean uh the, the, it's unparalleled as a matter of fact we've got more manuscripts and then these manuscripts that line up with manuscripts written from people who are on different continents and different centuries it mm -hmm. again it is unparalleled and we can rest assured that 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 argument by bart Ernst and I agree with you, he's more of an atheist if you ask me. Mm -hmm. That argument by him fails because the consistency of scripture can be compared to nothing else. Yeah, and I, you know, Elder, I, I find it really interesting that he compared it that way because that's completely taking, taken out the written version. Yes. That only deals with the oral version. Now, the written version, now if you have that same circle and you uh -huh. write down the sky is blue today, and you tell the next person to write it down, they're looking at it. Yes. <laughs> you even talked about the pictorial language of the yeah. uh, Hebrew text. So right. it wasn't just oral, oral tradition was important. But another thing I want to say about oral tradition, you cannot compare oral tradition in the way they study oral tradition in the way we do. I right. can't remember 10 phone numbers in my phone right now. <laughs> right. I know like four. I know my, my, my wife, when we were still dating, made me memorize her number. I'm, I, I don't got to memorize it. I got it in my phone. She's like, no, right. your, your phone right. might die. You need to memorize your number. Right? Absolutely. But we don't, you know, now we got iPads. We got TV shows we're watching. I mean, it's so many distractions that, you know, back then they didn't have all of that. They would no. study the word of God and they had the yeah. time to dedicate to that. And if I can add that to elders, sure. um, I, I was just reading uh, Dr. Craig Keener and uh, it was a, his commentary on Matthew. And he makes a great point that in that school of thought um, in ancient um, in ancient Rome, well, you know, when the Romans were taking over at that time, um, if you were a Jew, 
you know, they learned from the Romans where the Romans would say, hey, look, in their ancient school of thought, they had to memorize, they had to memorize everything. And so if you're a Jew, even in a time of Christ uh, with the New Testament, I know I'll be talking about the New Testament tune, um, they have to mem uh, memorize a lot of things, even to the point if you're like uh, one of the disciples of Christ uh, and ultimately become an apostle and then even being uh, under the apostles teaching, you had to memorize these things that they were being taught. So, you know, when people uh, sit here and say these things like Bart Ehrman may say, uh, like a game of telephone, um, you're what you're doing is being disingenuous and you're really just um, kind of disregarding, um, you know, the the discipline of those of ancient of ancient times, whether that's in the New Testament or even in the old. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. That's really good. You know, <laughs> you know, Skeptics, they, they have to come up with these arguments. Otherwise, they would have to admit the authenticity of Scripture, and they're not ready or willing to do that, right. <laughs> you know, in any way, right. form, or fashion. So, yeah, definitely. I think that's, I think that's really, really good information. We talked uh, a little bit last month about the uh, sulfurs. Though, you know, they had people that would count the uh, letters yeah. in, in the, in the mm. uh, Hebrew language. So that yes. they wouldn't. And, and another thing, they had regard for Come the on. word of God. That's right. Well, they yeah. believe the scripture that said, if you add to this, Come the on. plagues in this book will be added to you. If you take away, then your name will be taken away. You know, they believe that. So they did not purposely. And, 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 and brothers, I, um, I made a statement last month that may have kind of shocked some people. You know, the fact that we don't have any of the original writings from mm -hmm. Moses or Paul or Matthew. We don't, we don't have any of those. And I think that's why it's so important for our churches to have Bible studies where we talk about these things, not right. just talking about, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, I think there's a place for, you know, the, the preaching and God said, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, emotionalism, I think is okay. A little bit of that is fine, you know, but I think there needs to be a balance. I'm not saying every ministry has to be completely 100% focused on apologetics, but I do think apologetics needs to be a part of every ministry. Amen. Yeah. I think so. You know, I, absolutely. I that. We stuff. have to, we have to, you know, we have to know this stuff because when we're confronted, you know, like I said, many of us think that God wrote the Bible. Now, Elder, you talked a little bit of, you know, Moses and Samuel, you know, wrote certain books of the Bible. But there actually is a portion of the Bible that God himself wrote. Oh, yeah. Right? It <laughs> was called yeah. the, Ten the Ten Commandments. Commandments. Right? That's right. He wrote it with, the, with his own finger. But Moses destroyed it. Is that is that right? That, 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 you in the book. Yeah. yeah he, he, he shattered that. And yes. then God was like, okay, fine. You write it. <laughs> you, you, go, you go ahead and chisel out every last right. one of these uh, commands. I tried to help y'all, you know. But yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's yeah. good. That's All right. Good. So, Minister Dez, go ahead and, okay, so now, like Elder Mike, you were bringing out the, the scope of the Old Testament, right? So, over 1,100 year period that the Old Testament was written, okay? Um, it dealt with, with an unnumerable amount of kings, uh, yes. succession, succession of kings, and, yes. and uh, 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 the, the Jewish nation split in two at, at one point. So it, it's, it's very large and scoping, right? Yes. But the New Testament is not as much. It was written in about a maybe a 50-year period under maybe one or two kings, all in one area, you know, so it, it wasn't as, as scoping as the Old Testament. So we're going to have our minister, Dez, to just tell us a little bit about how we actually got the New Testament. So we learned from Elder Mike, and go back and watch this again, and, you know, Elder Mike just kind of just kind of scratched the surface a little bit of how we got the Old Testament. He talked a little bit about the pa uh, papyrus, am, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reeds or whatnot, the stone that they were writing in. And a lot of these things, and I brought this up last month, a lot of these, these um, uh, tools were not going to last forever. <laughs> you know? Right, And exactly. I also brought out, you know, because the, the question is, and I dealt with this last month, the question is, why didn't God preserve the originals, right? And I think a couple of reasons. Number uh, one of those reasons is because we have this tendency to worship stuff, <laughs> you know, mm. we'll we be worshiping the actual 
papyrus that Moses wrote on or the <laughs> stones right. that, that he chiseled right about out. And, then, uh, and right. then another reason is if he had preserved the originals, if someone had gotten their hands on them, they could have changed anything yes. in there. But because we have so many, Elder Mike talked about the, all the various manuscripts that we have, and we right. touched on that last month, all these manuscripts we have, it's virtually impossible to change anything because we have so many be manuscripts. So yeah. actually, God not preserving the mm. originals helped yeah. preserve the message. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, just real quick, mm -hmm. and that was good. I might preach that, uh, <laughs> but uh, that was good. Um, but real quick, just to add, as you said, they had to count the letters, mm -hmm. and and they would then they would announce the word if they were if there was any errors in it. They would they had a practice where they would go out and bury it, right? I wow. mean, because they didn't want it to be in circulation. You know, but at the same time, because we have all these manuscripts, if you had 100 people copying the same thing, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to find the what are called variances. And these were the, the so-called errors. And most were uh, most were basically due to pronunciation, not pronunciation, but grammatical errors, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, but but these variants are easily found. If, if the three of us are writing something mm -hmm. and I'm the only one that wrote something different in one spot, well, Chances are, if, if you two wrote the same thing, chances are Mike messed up right here. So when th think about this in, in relation to thousands of manuscripts, it's easy to find those small variances. Yep. See, Bart Ehrman would make a false claim. Oh, there are more, more errors in the Bible than there are words in the Bible. But what he's not telling you is that the reason that is is because of the thousands of manuscripts that we have and our mm -hmm. ability to find those variances by comparing them with those other manuscripts we can more easily identify when an, when a scribe may have written something incorrectly because mm -hmm. all of the other thousands of manuscripts we have are consistent and so the, again like you said you know god preserving the copies of the copies of the copies give us more of an assurance you know doubt just then then just have Having one original manuscript. Amen. Whoa. Absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, uh, Des, I'm coming for you, brother. But uh, oh, before no, I do, I, I talked about this, and I'm glad Elder Mike just brought this up. I'm gonna put this up. I showed this last time, so I'm just I feel good about the confirmation that you brothers are giving me. But this is from the uh, one of my favorite books. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist by Norm Geisler and Frank <laughs> Turek. But they bring this up here. Uh, I don't know. Can you all see this? Okay. So they were talking about the different. So. Philippians 4 and 13 is not in question, but if it were, let's just use this for an example. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Look at numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if Lavelle wrote number 1 and I missed the H in things, you can still kind of figure out what the sentence is saying. Right. But then Elder Mike writes number 2, but he leaves the I out. Dez writes number 3, and he leaves the N out, right? And somebody else writes number 4, and they leave... But because we have all these various man, all these these varying manuscripts, we can piece together and know exactly what the original said. Yes, yeah. that's good. I think I think about my Muslim friends and they tell me that they have the original Quran, uh, the original word of God. And I say, well, this is the thing you're getting confused, the original language versus the actual autographs. Um, you know, and we'll, I know we'll talk about it later, but, mm -hmm. you know, no, nothing in antiquity has the autographs. But God in his infinite wisdom, and his sovereignty has given us copies. And that just shows us that God knows what he's doing and we don't. <laughs> so, <Amen. That's laughs> yes, that, sir. That's right. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to say this quote real quick. Um, this is from Norm Geisler's book, uh, General Introduction to the Bible. It is God who regulated the canon. And we're going to talk, we're going to get into the canon in a minute. Man merely recognized the authority that God gave to it. So man didn't make the canon. God made the canon. All we did was recognize it. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, so Minister Dez, talk a little bit about how we got the New Testament. Absolutely, um, and it's a great question. You know, well, to start, you know, we have to understand that the New Testament was like an outburst, per se, of proclamation of God's word after the coming of Christ. Um, the apostles or co-laborers who wrote each book didn't assume that their writings were simply mere writings, because, you know, you have people who will come against uh, Paul's letters. Um, <laughs> Elder Mike, know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of people who come against Paul's <laughs> letters, talking about it's just a commentary. Right. Like, no, it's actually inspired. Uh, but the apostles were not 
uh, were sent. They were sent uh, directly by Christ and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, we could take into Paul's statements in Second Corinthians chapter three, um, in verse six, uh, he refers to himself and the other apostles as ministers of a new covenant. Also, his ministry is inspired by the Spirit, as it talks about in verses six and eight. Uh, Paul understood. Unlike many, Paul understood that he and the other apostles were entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. Right. But, and this is very important, too. Uh, Paul tells us, tells his audience uh, to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, that Christ is speaking through him as well. Now, this is also important, too. Now, concerning the arrangement of the New Testament and the nine apostles uh, who wrote the New Testament, because, you know, if you ask many people, for example, we look at the Gospel of Mark, which many believe that that was the first um, uh, gospel produced mm -hmm. and some disagree. But um, a lot a lot of scholars believe that. Well, we understand that Mark was not an apostle. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but do we still consider his gospel as the word of God? Well, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so let's deal with the arrangement of books first. Um, the arrangement of books is not based on the dates of the 27 books. Um, the 27 books, um, you know, when we look at the New Testament, it is arranged by length and genre. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, what do we do with books like Mark, Luke, Jude and Hebrews? Uh, though they were not apostles, they were co-laborers with the other apostles. In other words, their message was based on their relationship with the apostles. And I believe uh, it will be the same way in the Old Testament as well. Um, you have to know somebody. You have to know a prophet. Right. You have to know an apostle. You have to uh, you know those in order to be able to write something inspired in the inspired word of God for it to be considered canon. Um, so, for example, though the author of Hebrews is unknown, though some may say it's Paul, um, though some may uh, attribute it to Paul, nevertheless, Hebrews was written in the earliest years of the apostles. Um, Hebrews was actually being cited by in the first century by Clement in his letters. Um, the author of Hebrews, he tells us um, in his letter that he is a co-laborer with Timothy. So it's a lot of these things that we see, but this is how we get the New Testament. But uh, we see that if you're an apostle or you're close to the apostles, um, God will speak um, in being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we can consider that as canon. And that's how the New Testament in so many words um, in a short version <laughs> is developed. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, like I said, it, the, like Elder Mike said, we could talk for months on this topic alone, you know. Um, so so now you brought up an interesting point about the different um, requirements for the canon. All right. So I wrote this note here and you all tell me I, I, I think there were five criteria. Number one was, was the book written by an apostle or prophet of God? Number two, was that writer confirmed by acts of God? Number three, did the message tell the truth about God? Number four, does it come with the power of God? And number five, was it accepted by the people of God? So I think those were just some of the principles involved in discovering the canon. All right. Absolutely. So now let, let's jump a little bit into the canon. And Elder Mike, my question for you is what were the criteria for a book being accepted <laughs> into the canon? Are these five sufficient? And can you explain what they mean or yeah. whatever they are? So go ahead, my brother. Yeah, I actually don't. Man, you were dead on. Man, those five really encapsulate what the thinking was of the early Christian believers, because one of the reasons we had to establish a canon, because some people even push back on canon, but the reason we have to establish uh, a canon is because of what, what is called pseudepigraphal writing, which means that you had a lot of extent writings. You had a gospel of Judas, a gospel of uh, Mary, and other books that were written by people claiming to be uh, the word of God. And so uh, people can be led astray. So it was important. The early church fathers, the early church leaders recognize we've got to get a hold on this to establish what it is that's coming from God versus what's coming from the, uh, you know, these pseudepigraphal writers. So some people would write a book in the name of an apostle that wasn't written by that apostle, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so they were counterfeit. They were false teachers. And so this became very important. So as you brought out, when they had to validate that it was either written by a prophet or apostle, how did they do this? Well, 
one of the reasons, this is another reason why ch early church history becomes vitally important. We can go back to men like Polycarp, men like uh, uh, Ignatius, who were disciples of the apostles and, mm -hmm. and read their writings and their affirmations up in their quotes, actually, from many of the apostles. And as well as Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr quotes from the uh, writings from the apostles as well as uh, 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 Irenaeus as well. So these men, their writings become very important because as we look throughout church history and we can see disciples of the apostles or disciples of the disciples of the apostles, and we find that throughout the history, certain letters have been accepted as written by John, written by Paul, written by Peter, we were able to say, well, yeah, this book should be included within the canon. So, yeah, so, so it had to be have some type of apostolic affirmation. Jesus said in St. John chapter number 17, he said, Blessed are they who believe on me through your words. Mm. He said, through your words. So, so their words are important. And so we had to validate what their words are, as well as, like you said, uh, you know, uh, the truthfulness of it, right? Mm -hmm. There are no varying things. This is another reason. You can read the, the gospel of Judas and get, you, you won't get halfway through, but before you say, man, this don't sound like <laughs> none of the rest of the Bible. You're you know right. what I'm saying? It's just ridiculous. Uh, the gospel of Mary and all these things that cannot be confirmed. And, and as well as uh, accepted, like I said, in church history, these things are important. And like I said, you, you encapsulated that beautifully this is why we need a canon of scripture, you all. There too, and it, we we should know that today. How many folks getting up today talking about I got a word from the Lord? Absolutely, I got a word. And, and on and what's sad is many of them are even putting their their so called revelation on par with scripture, and that mm. becomes dangerous. So we, which and you brought out in Erison earlier, we have the authority. This is what we call it: the authority of the scripture, meaning that when the scripture speaks, it becomes the authority, not my words, not my opinions, but the scriptures. Yes, yes. So you know, I always, uh, I always think back to. The, you know, okay, so, Des, you talked a little bit about the, you know, how, how soon these books were written. You know, Mark being that first gospel, and he, of course, got his information from the Apostle Peter, who was an eyewitness, right? Uh, we know Matthew and and uh, John were both eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. Luke was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul, you know, so, you know, each one is verified. And I was reading somewhere today, Elder, that the... um originally 20 of the 27 books, there was no dispute over them being inducted into the canon. There were mm -hmm. seven that were questionable, um, but they ended up, you know, adding the, you know, uh, determining that they were actually, uh, you know, canon uh, scripture. But, but the, the word canon, from my understanding, means uh, measuring stick, right? Absolutely. Wasn't it a, yeah. a reed or something that they would canon up in the in Greek and yeah. they would use it as a, can you talk a little bit about, about the word canon? I, I don't, I want to make sure that the audience understands what we mean when we say the canon of scripture. We're not talking about the big gun on wheels, yeah. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. The, so the canon, uh, it, it's a rod, like you said, a reed or a rod, and they used it to measure. And why this be, why this is important is they measure they were trying to get the right measurements for whatever they may have been building. So when we say canon, we basically want to know what should we use as the standard mm -hmm. that we might determine what truth is. Mm -hmm. If I come out with a so-called revelation, mm -hmm. then it becomes the job of the church to line what I'm saying up against the rule, which mm -hmm. or the canon to see if it measures up to the canon. And if it does not, it should be re rejected. Why? Because the canon is the authority. The rule or the rod is the authority. And that's so when we use the word canon, I'm glad you brought that out because you're right. Sometimes we throw terms out as if everybody just understands them. So, so thank you for bringing that out. You know, but so when we say canon, we basically, the, the canon of scripture, we're basically saying that everything must be compared to the word of God. It is the final authority. It is our source of truth. Amen. I, I have a quote here from uh, J.I. Packer. Mm -hmm. 
He said this, the church no more gave us the New Testament canon than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. <laughs> Come on. That's God right. gave good. us gravity and he gave us the New Testament. All, hmm. all the church did was discovered what God had already proclaimed. Talking good, Doc. Right? Yes, so, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I, one of the earliest creeds in the church, I, I know uh, when, when, when the Apostle Paul got saved, when he gave his life to Christ, right, mm -hmm. he met with Peter for, I, I believe it was 15 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. and we know they weren't just sitting around chopping it up, talking about, the game, the, the right. Olympic games, right? Right, right. You know, I'm sure, you know, and it possibly was then that he received what he quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which was a early, probably the earliest creed, which goes back to within five years of the birth of the church, mm. right? And, and, he, and he gave this creed, and it was something that he memorized. It was something that the people would memorize, and he actually challenged in 1 Corinthians 15 to go out and talk to these people. He listed them by name mm -hmm. and challenged them to go out and talk to these people people he said most of them are still alive go talk to them for yourself yes sir right now 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 one thing um you know now uh you know put people kind of get nervous when they say well some of the books of the Bible, some of the books of the new testament were written 20 or 30 years after christ now just to kind of bring it to bring it home a little bit the september 11th attacks 2001 you realize september 11th of this year It'll be 20 years. Wow. When I say I remember it so vividly, I could tell you exactly what <laughs> I was doing right. at the moment the planes hit the towers. I could go into detail. So mm -hmm. if 10 years from now, somebody comes up to my son, who's only nine months old now, but he'll be... 10 years old, going on 10 years old at that time, if somebody went up to him and said, yeah, well, you know, 30 years ago when the terrorists attacked the Trade Center and they hit the, and the towers fell, these dragons came up out and they were flying <laughs> around burning people up. Guess what? He could come and ask me. Yes, sir. With the help of the Lord, I'll be still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be able to explain to him, no, that didn't happen. Plus, on top of that, now we actually have video footage. So they didn't right. have video footage back then. But the people who were alive at the time when these things happened, nobody would be able to write a book within the lifetime of Jesus' apostles or, his con or their contemporaries that contradicted what happened because there were too many eyewitnesses that were there. And they'd be like, no, that didn't happen. And I think, too, also, elders, you guys make such valid points. I think it's uh, Josh McDowell in his book, mm -hmm. The New Evidence, uh, that demands a verdict. Uh, if, uh, by the way, if anyone's watching, get that book. Definitely. It's very, very good to have. It's a classic. But I believe he makes in his um, in his book, he makes a point when dealing with the manuscripts. He talks about how he, people don't understand how quick, how quick that the uh, for the apostles to write, you know, um, you know about jesus and his ministry about the events that happened 20 to 30 years later um that is very very early compared to you look at alexander the great we don't mm -hmm. even know anything really about him till hundreds of years later so for you to get something concerning jesus and what he did in his ministry um the timeline of those things that's just it's it's, it's remarkable but mm -hmm. it, once again it just shows how how uh, powerful god is and how important he viewed the gospel again the gospel out there with the uh through manuscripts and uh just getting the preaching of the gospel out there so so yeah amen, amen. absolutely absolutely and since we're talking to you des uh, my next question is how can we trust the bible when we don't have the original writings right we we, we touched on it a little bit but tell us a little bit about you know somebody says well if we don't have the original writings of paul or the original writings of matthew then we can't we can't trust it. Why is that is that valid? Can we can we not trust the Bible because we don't have any of the actual um, original writings or what they call autographs? You know the funny thing about this, I heard I remember hearing this about six years ago, mm -hmm. and I remember someone telling me, and it was a Christian. They're like, "Hey, look, we don't have 
the autographs and, and the scholars will say, and I'm not a scholar, but the scholars will call the original writings and call them autographs. We don't have the autographs of the Old Testament or the New Testament. And honestly, that's OK. As Christians, that should give us a, a level to just kind of, you know, just take a breather like, man, OK, it's cool. We don't have the autographs um, of those original writings. Now, if we have the autographs of the Quran or if we have the uh, original autographs of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, then, you know, then if we wouldn't. Then that's a problem. But the great thing about this whole entire thing. There's no autographs coming out of antiquity for anything whatsoever. And when I say antiquity, I'm talking about the ancient, uh, the ancient world. We don't have the autographs, any of that. So uh, for those who are watching, you know, this, Dez, I'm uh, sorry, real, real quick. When I was in school, I, I'm not sure exactly how old you are, but when I was in school, they made us read Homer's Iliad. I was just about to bring that up. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, you know, we had to read Homer's Iliad, and and no teacher that I had came to me and said, now. We don't have the original writings, exactly. um, so this may not be accurate. They believe that the words written down in the Iliad are from Homer. They, so, it, go ahead. And the funny, and, and, you know, Elder Lavelle, the thing is, um, scholars who are uh, non-Christian or even people on the street, they try to use those points when they were talking about, you know, uh, Alexander the Great, and they try to bring up different things of history that trying to oppose Christianity. They don't question. They don't question the history of that. They don't question the autographs of these things. They just take it as face value, which is okay. But if we're going to be consistent across the board, if we look at Homer's, right, uh, the Iliad, um, we only have 64, 64 uh, manuscripts of that compared to, um, and hopefully I'm not skipping ahead, but we have over uh, 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, but then we also have 25,000 in different languages of the New Testament. See, this is why it's important to understand things such as uh, the Codex Vaticanus, the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, what we have is copies of copies, okay? No, we don't have the original, but no one has the original manuscripts of anything. So as Christians, it's okay, take a breather because don't nobody have the autographs, <laughs> but we have more we have more copies than anyone else in the whole entire world. And that goes into our favor. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, um, I showed a video last time where um, this uh, brother was illustrating what you were just saying with coffee beans. And he had cups set out, uh, you know, and he, you know, like you said, it was maybe 64, uh, copies of the Iliad. He put 64 little beans into the cup. And for the Bible, like you said, it was over 6,000. He poured it. It filled it. The, it the, the cup was down here and it was just overflowing with beans. And then he brought up the 25,000 in other languages that we have. So we can be confident that what we have is the actual word of God. And I just want to also add one more thing, so I forgot to bring this up. Uh, when it comes to the New Testament, for example, in the Bible, period, and I know um, uh, Elder Mike is going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we can have trust in the New Testament um, because when it stands, uh, when it stands against textual criticism or reliability, the New Testament stands up there with it's undisputed. So I just want to add that in as well. Hey Amen. Absolutely, man. And uh, you know, you you brought up a good point. If 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 we were the only ones that didn't have the originals, then we might be a little like, yikes, you know, <laughs> if yeah. everybody else had all their originals and we didn't, then, you know, we we would we would be um, <clears throat> attacked <laughs> and and rightfully so, you know, but like you said, nobody does. So that is a blessing and something that we can be firm in our beliefs. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> Minister Dez, you brought up the all the uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. So, Elder Mike, my next question is for you: What was the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls being found in? I think it was nineteen forty-five, six, seven, seven, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I actually, I just heard a story today. Okay. About how it happened. It was some young man who was looking for his sheep, some young shepherd or something like that, and he threw a rock to see if the sheep was in the. Thing or whatnot, you know, and ended mm -hmm. up hearing a cracking of a of a of a um, container and went in there, and that that was how he found it. But uh, what was the significance? Because we we hear a lot about the Dead Sea Scrolls. What what are the Dead Sea Scrolls, and what significance did they have? 
Yeah. Right. So, I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls are definitely one of the most fascinating archaeological finds uh, of our lifetime because there was always been a lot of pushback because although we've given a lot of evidence specifically of the authenticity of the Old Testament, the problem that the church faced with uh, many of the uh, uh, skeptics was that the copies we had were from the ninth century. <laughs> and I'm talking the, the actual copies of the Old Testament we had were well after even the New Testament had ended. Mm. But these were, well, again, and I brought this up briefly, the Masoretic text. Now, again, uh, you know, we we can affirm the authenticity of the Masoretic text, but the pushback was that, come on, man, these things were written, you know, 2,500 years ago, and, and yet you all are saying you the only copies you all have are come 2,500 years later. Come on, and, and so there was a lot of pushback. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as you brought out, was which was found around 1947, okay. when the, the person threw the rock, right, hmm. and he identified these caves that held what we know today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. These scrolls, within these scrolls, there were copies of all of the books in the Old Testament scripture, I believe with the exception of Ruth. Hmm. And what's interesting is when the uh, textual critics and archeologists did a, a timestamp on these, mm -hmm. that the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually written about a thousand years earlier mm. than our oldest text of the Old Testament. You know, it dated back to the first potentially early second century, which was an amazing find. And on top of that, now here it is, and, and just to add a little bit more to that, is that this cave was inhabited in history by people who were called the Essenes. Now, anybody knows anything about the Essenes, they were strict religious Jews who didn't want anything to do with Christ. So they, it, it's not like there was any type of collusion where now nah, these, these were Christians anyway. And yeah, okay. Christians came up with this. No, these caves were inhabited by the Essenes. And although they would have believed the old Testament scripture, they, they, they had no vested interest to prove Christianity to be right. And so, so when you started to review these, texts that we had from the first century, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you compare them against the Masoretic text that we had, you found that they were virtually the same. Of course, there were uh, grammatical variances, and, and I think you brought up a wonderful thing when you, when you showed the example about uh, Philippians 4.13. So they found small things like that. But in terms of the, the validation of what the text was saying, we found that the Dead Sea Scrolls were right on point with what we had. So it did two things for us. One, it gave us a more authoritative copy that dated back because, of course, the older, the better. The, mm -hmm. That which is more closer to the days it was written, the better. That was good. Secondly, it confirmed that what we already had was true because, again, when you compared it, you did not find many differences. So, this, I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I can go on and on. It's just so much other stuff that we can get into. Now, it, not only were the Bible, there, the, many of the apocryphal books were included, and other writings were included. So, again, th this wasn't just about, the Dead Sea Scrolls wasn't just about proving the Bible to be right. These were just men who collected Jewish writings, right, which included the old Tanakh, the old canon of scripture called the Tanakh. And so, and again, we were able to validate that what we had is true. We can trust our Bible, you all. And as you all already brought out, we got more evidence than any other uh, uh, archaeological source in antiquity. Amen. Amen. Look, Elder, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to go to Minister Des for this next question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but one of your teachings I was watching on YouTube, mm -hmm. you, you kind of named the the Old Testament books and how it was something about the numbers. Like I know yeah, yeah. the, the cap, the, uh, the, the Catholic church has some other books added in uh, to, to their canon. And uh, I do want to talk about that just briefly, but um, if you can, if you can, I don't know if you can find that, that, uh, 
that slide yeah. you had or whatever, just kind of look for that while I go to Des about sure. that. But I want to make sure that people understand and realize that because I know I know originally you were saying that first and second Samuel were one book. Right. First and second Kings were one book. So yes. you had named the uh, the number because you were what you were talking about was was when Jesus uh, made a statement in the Gospels about um, he was he was com he was compassing the whole Old Testament. Yes. And confirming that the Old Testament is the word of God. And he said from the the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Yes, sir. Some, something to that effect. So if you can talk about that now, um, you want okay. me to go to Dez now or you want to talk about it now? Yeah, go ahead and I'm going to find that slide if you okay. want to go to Dez first. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about that because that's good stuff. Now, Dez, yes, Minister Dez, now Elder Mike said that the canon is closed. Yes. All right. Yes. We can't add any more to it. I, you know, I can't write something and say this is scripture, right? So, for a second, just talk to us a little bit about when the canon was completed and why can't we add any other books to the canon? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, the canon, once see the completion of the canon around 170, 180. Uh, AD all depends on who you talk to what scholar you may read but around that time it's about a 10 year difference uh, either way um, so you don't have any dispute about the books um, you have a little bit uh, concerning the book of Revelation uh, at the Council of Laodicea or Laodicea um, in 363 so you see that big long span but at the same time you still have those books in circulation for a very very long time for in the first century uh, but the reason why you can't add to the Bible now, you can't add to the canon uh, in its clothes because um, as Elder Lavelle, as you pointed out with the five points, and I think I only got four of them, uh, but they don't fit the criteria. If you write anything or if I write anything today and I say, oh, this is the word of God. Well, does it fit the criteria? Right. Um, the first one was the was the writer, a prophet, apostle or close to one of the uh, of an apostle or prophet. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, is the book accepted uh, by the body of Christ by large? OK. Mm -hmm. um, and then thirdly, uh, does that book contain consistent orthodox teaching? See, this is the problem with a lot of people who say, well, you know, I can put my word, uh, my revelation uh, with the word of God, with the, wow. the revelation that is found in the 66. Well, you, what you saying? ain't even proper orthodoxy <laughs> okay so you don't even you don't even fit the criteria right there um and and just to make a even a point and something we've been consistent on uh tonight uh all together is that we discredit uh the uh, uh the uh ancient body of the ancient believers right uh the ancient church we discredit ancient jews because when we say things like oh they must have not even known uh what was orthodox and what wasn't as uh, both elders, both um, Elder Michael Lavelle, well, both of you guys said earlier, they they study, they study the ins and outs of the scriptures. So they understood if someone was going to come on a scene and begin to preach uh, a Gnostic gospel, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. So they could say, like, that's not inspired by the word of God. Uh, the Apostle Paul, um, Jude would not write that. Right. Um, and then on the fourth point, um, did the book bear evidence of the morality and spiritual uh, spirituality of the Holy Spirit. And that's very important. That is why uh, when we look at cult doctrine today, where there's someone who is in, and they're going to tell me I'm picking on them, but uh, someone, if they're a Hebrew Israelite, for example, and they say, well, you know, I, I got some, I got uh, some, some writings and it's on the same level. No, it's not. You're going to try to sit here and say that this is the word of God, but still deny Paul's writings. When the second Peter chapter three tells you that um, they look at Paul's letters as scripture. Yes. So um, so once again, that is the criteria. That's why the canon is closed. When God is speaking through the apostles, once again, they, they knew, Paul knew, the apostles knew this wasn't just mere letters they, they were writing or commentary. This was the word of God and their followers knew it. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I, I, excellent explanation. And I think that one of the reasons the canon has to be closed, minister, is because Okay, let's use, and, and I'm, we're not picking on anybody, but I know the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in progressive revelation. So Jesus is coming back in 19, whatever it was, 14 or 11 or whatever it was. He didn't come back, so now they have to add to it and explain why he didn't come back. 
We don't have to do that with the Bible. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to add anything because the Bible is, as we said in the very beginning, is sufficient on its own. Man, that's plain and simple. If you look at any other religion, any other group, especially the uh, cults out here in today's time with, that was created within the last 100 years, they always have to find a loophole. Always. And I want anyone who watches, they always have to find a loophole yeah. to um, make their doctrine sufficient. Right. Well, mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back here. Well, he, he he's not coming back. Uh, well, you know, you got to understand this is what he really meant. No, let the word of God be the word of God. Um, and unfortunately, when you get uh, people who are in cults, um, they don't want to take the word of God as the word of God because it, uh, it's pertaining to their flesh. This is why they are join cults or they mm -hmm. create a cult. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my wife and I are reading through the book of Galatians and she looked at it like, how can they, speaking of the uh, Hebrew Israelites, how can they deny this? And I said, that's why many of them have to get rid of Paul. Amen. They, they have to, because if they don't, they don't <laughs> have a leg to stand on. So, you know, it's like they have to get rid of, 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 of Paul because everything that he teaches, if, if it is scripture, and we know that it is because it was confirmed as canon, uh, the Apostle Peter, who was one of the closest to the Lord Jesus when he was here on earth, confirmed that it was scripture, as Minister Dez brought out. So, you know, we don't, we don't need to get rid of any biblical authors because the biblical authors that we have, the 66 books, like you said, they are closed. They are, and thank God they are. Yes. You know, any 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 so-called revelation or, as you said, illumination that I get from those scriptures is strictly that. But it cannot, it cannot be on par with scripture. Yes. Amen. Yes. All right, Elder Mike. So, yes, sir. Now, we were um. So, so my next question, and 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 you could deal into what we were talking about a little bit earlier about the uh, the, the 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 books of the of the Old Testament. But uh, my next question was, how can we trust the books of the Bible when we don't know who the authors of some of the books are? So, like, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, for instance. We don't know right. who wrote the book of um, of Ruth. Uh, or or Esther, right? We don't know who wrote these books. So if we don't know who wrote them, how can we trust that they are actually the word of God and that they belong in the canon of scripture? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a, a great question. And I think Minister Dez actually hit on this a little earlier when he was explaining about the canon. And I thought he did an awesome job doing so. Even though we don't know who the author of Hebrews is, mm -hmm. what we have is a historical account of the acceptance of its writing mm -hmm. within the within the congregations of the church. And, and when you talk about books like Ruth, the same thing. They were embraced and accepted by the people of God, by Moses. By what? Well, well, Ruth wasn't accepted necessarily by Moses because it was written after, but the point is by the prophets and by the Israelites of that time, it was always accepted within the community of the believers and considered uh, as authoritative scripture and and just you know to hit on even the point we were talking about earlier just to kind of solidify that we hold to the same biblical text as even the israelites in the old testament you know josephus who was one who um was a jewish historian and this was was in the first century he wrote down because a lot of people was they'll they'll who, ask who, who was who was not a Christian, by the way. Who was not a Christian. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. He was he was certainly not a Christian. But Josephus made a statement that we have 22 books. Mm -hmm. And now somebody might say, and just kind of alluding to the point that you brought out earlier, somebody would say, mm -hmm. well, aha, what do you mean 22 books? And, then, you know, because people ask, should the Apocrypha be included, right? 
when you break down the 22 books of the Hebrew Bible, and some would say 24, depending on how it was broken down, but mm -hmm. but if you could just, I'm, I'm sharing the slide, if you can add that slide to the screen. Yes, sir. And, and let me just say this right before we sure. do that. Sure. So as of now, we have 39 books in our Old Testament. 39 books, absolutely. And we have 27 in our New Testament. That equals the 66 that we have. So Absolutely. What, Elder, what Elder Mike is saying is that Josephus said we had 22 books of the Old Testament. So exactly. does that mean that the other, I'm not that great at math, the other books that equals, <laughs> equals 39 <laughs> right. were added? We're going to let Elder Mike talk about that. Here you go, Elder. Yes, sir. So when you study the Jewish Bible, you'll understand that they grouped the 12 minor prophets into one book mm -hmm. <laughs> known as the 12. Mm -hmm. So now already we've got uh, the, so taking those 12 minor prophets, we already now are down to the 30, I'm, I'm sorry, down to the 33 rather. Mm -hmm. And I'm messing up here, right? <laughs> then so, oh, I'm so just, right, just, right. I'm sorry. We're yeah. up from from Josephus, who said it was 22 books. Uh huh. If you break, if you add those minor prophets, those 12 minor prophetical books together, mm -hmm. now we're up to 33. Right, right, right. And just, just so you know, when he talks about the minor prophets, everybody he's talking about Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Zechariah and Malachi. Did I get that right? Zechariah, Haggai, Zephaniah, Haggai. Malachi. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. And so, the, but but in the Jewish Bible, they make that one book. You okay. know, we break it down in our Bible. We call them the minor. We call them the minor prophets. There was right. nothing minor about them, actually. But uh, yeah. other than the size of their writing, that's all we're saying when we say minor is the size of their writing. But and then they come, as you brought out earlier, they combine first and second Samuel together. That gets us up to 34. They combine first and second Kings together that gets us up to 35 they combine first and second chronicles together that gets us up to 36 they combine ezra and nehemiah together that gets us up to 37 they combine ruth and that should be judges together mm -hmm. that gets us up to 38 and the in lamentations you all know was written by jeremiah the prophet mm -hmm. and they include lamentations with the prophet jeremiah which gets us up to our 39 now, some there are some Jews that say that there was 24, and some of them just don't combine Ezra and Nehemiah and Ruth and Judges. But at the, but at the end of the day, when you validate what the Jews held to as the sacred scripture of the Old Testament, you find that it is the exact. 39 books that we hold to in the New Covenant Church, that these books are, and they have been authenticated throughout Israelite and Jewish history. Amen. Amen. So, so Elder. Yes, sir. Uh, I, this wasn't, I didn't, I didn't have this listed as one of the questions. Sure. But can you briefly talk about the apocryphal books? Yeah. And what they are, let's define that because I want to make sure the audience understands exactly what we're talking about. Talk a little bit about the apocryphal books and why you feel they should not be included as scripture. And do they have any relevance whatsoever? Or should, should they be completely thrown out, burned up, you know, you know, mm -hmm. thrown away? Don't <laughs> we can't get nothing out of them. Or can we get a little something out of them, but they're just not on part with scripture? Go ahead. And, and, and just uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if someone happens to go to a Catholic church and they open up that Bible, they're going to see more than 39 books in the Old Testament. They're going right. to see these other added books. And I just want to make that clear as what the apocryphal books are. Maybe you can define what apocryphal means. And then what is the, um, is there any use for them for today? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's a great question. It's something that's, that's, that's hotly, and when I say hotly, hotly debated <laughs> today, you know, whether or not the apocryphal books should be included. Well, when we talk about the apocryphal books, we're talking about what were considered lost books, books that were uh, taken away. But but the when we study again, this is why I pointed out what the Jews held to as their Old Testament canonical scriptures. They did not include the apocrypha in their list of 22 slash 24 books. The apocryphal books were not included. 
It was, and as you brought out earlier, it was Christ when he said, when he said that the judgment was about to come on Israel, and he says, God's going to avenge the blood of righteous Abel, right? All the way up to Zechariah. When you do that, you'll find that that encapsulizes the Old Testament scriptures. He doesn't go up to Maccabees, right? Mm -hmm. Right. He doesn't go up to Tobit. He doesn't go up to any of these uh, apocryphal books. Now, do they add value? I say absolutely. I believe. Right, Elder, 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 I'm sorry. One second. Before, no, you, no before problem. you go into that. Yeah. So when you say from Abel to Zech, righteous Abel to righteous Zechariah. Uh-huh. The New Testament, I mean, the Old Testament ends with Malachi. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, so how can we? So, did Jesus cut out from the book of Zechariah to the end of Malachi? Are those books not a part of the canon as as well? Oh, I see. That's a, a great question. Again, and I'm I'm just going to quote the scripture from. Sure. In, it's in Matthew 23 verse 35 because I want to quote it right. Okay that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom he slew between the temple. The last book in the Jewish Bible describes the death of Zacharias. And so the first book, we all know that Abel, being the son of Adam, was killed in the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis. Mm -hmm. The last book of the Hebrew Bible is the tells us the story of how Zacharias was killed. So what Christ was in essence doing, he was giving us the outline of the entire Old Testament scripture, and he was judging Israel for their rejection of the Old Testament and the Old Testament prophets in his day. So he gave us the scope there. He doesn't talk about Tobit. He doesn't talk about all these other writings. And so, yeah. again, this is why it's important to know some of the history, because you'll be saying, well, 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 that's not our last book. Well, it, from the Jewish perspective, it, yeah. it is the last book. And yes, Minister, sir. De Minister Dez brought up the fact that there... there the books of the Bible are not ordered like my DVD shelf. <laughs> I have my DVD shelf in alphabetical order. Right. They're not in alphabetical order. They're not even in order of the times or dates that they were released. Right, right. All right? That's not how they're ordered. So, yes, our Bible, Old Testament, ends with Malachi, but the, the, the Jewish scripture, the Hebrew Bible, ended with the story of the death of Zechariah, which was in... Was it in one of the Chronicles or Kings or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it was, it was, in, it was in the book of the, one of the Kings, one of the Kings or one Chronicles, kings. where they were compared, put, put together anyway, but yes. <laughs> so yeah, yes, so sir. That, when Jesus made that statement, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that, that, is, that it, I put it up on the screen when we air this, but when Jesus made that statement about from the righteous blood of Abel to Zechariah, he was encaps encapsulizing... Uh -huh. The the thirty nine books of the Old Testament that we have today. Yes, sir. All right, absolutely. I'm sorry, Elder. Go on. You were you were about to talk a little bit about the uh, those uh, the other apocryphal books. Well, well, just real briefly, I was going to say that yes, any serious Bible student should read. I, I, listen, I have got a copy of the Apocrypha. I think there there's a lot of good historical information there. As a matter of fact, you'll see some of the fulfillment of what Daniel talked about fulfilled mm. in uh, in the apocryphal books. You know, we find the desecration of the temple with Antio Antio Antiochus the mm fourth. -hmm going on in the apocryphal books. You find where God turns his back, or Israel rather, turns his back on God, and, and, and many of them are scattered abroad. So there's good historical information there. They were never, and this is what people say, they took it out of the Bible. No, they were <laughs> included with the scripture as the apocryphal books. They were never included as sacred books. They were yeah. included to historical, and remember, this is why I said that there was a 400, what, what, what theologians say 400 years of silence, right? But there was a 400 year span between the last book of our Bible in the Old Testament and the John the Baptist coming on the scene. So 
within that 400 years is when those apocryphal books were written. And so they were added just to provide us with a, the historical narrative of what took place in that space. And that, that does become important. And I would encourage people to write it. Uh, I'm sorry, read it. However, However, there are problems. Don't you can't take it as authoritative. There, there are problems with it, and we can get into that. And that'll be a whole another show. But there are problems with some of the texts. You know, some discrepancies, some contradictions in some of the texts. So we cannot take it as scripture. Yeah. So uh, I just read this today, so I don't have all of the facts on it. But I guess there was a man named Hermes mm -hmm. who wrote something called the Shepherd. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was mm -hmm. maybe 180, 190 AD, and at one point they, the church, they they were debating about whether to include that with scripture, and it, it they came to the decision that the canon was closed. It was not scripture. Mm -hmm. It was good, right? And it said, but it, uh, but one of the church fathers said it is not to be read in the assembly of the church with the brethren. You Absolutely. can read it on your own. You can get something out of it. It was mm -hmm. good information, yeah, but it yeah. was not scripture. Was when we talk Amen. about scripture, we're talking about the authoritative word of God. Yes. Now we can read some of these apocryphal books, but again, we're not to take them as scripture. They're not uh, definite words from God. They're good, like Elder Mike said, for historical purposes. Right. Uh, but not for anything that they're, they're not good for orthodoxy, for what we believe. Everything right. that we need to believe about God is in the 66 books that we have in the Bible today. Yes, sir. All right. So I, I just only got one more question here. So I'm going to let you all kind of talk about this. I'll, uh, El, uh, Minister Dez, you can start and then Elder Mike can uh, put the put the nail in the coffin there. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote this question. How were. The 66 books that we have today solidified into the Bible that we have today. So now we understand what the canon is. It's the, the measuring rod. Uh, we know that there were certain criteria for them to, to choose which books, or not to choose, to, to confirm which books God had already chosen to be in the Word of God. But now let's, let's tie this up in a nice bow tie knot. I need y'all to talk to me. Like I am a seven year old. I don't get stuff quick, y'all. I, I have to read stuff over and over again. So I want y'all to talk to me. Let, let's talk about this timeline here. How did the 66 books that we have, how did they get solidified into the Bible that we have today? Definitely. Um, and, and I know uh, Elder Mike, because, you know, we call him the Mike Jordan of this thing. So I know he's going to close this out. <laughs> You don't yes. close out a game six, not seven. You don't close out no. some game six real quick. <laughs> uh, um, no, so we look at the Hebrew canon. The Hebrew canon, or uh, well, the Hebrew Bible, excuse me, was already looked upon as canon, so to speak, amongst the Jews going back to the fourth century. Um, and it goes back to what uh, Elder Mike was just talking about. Um, there was this belief uh, up from uh, the fourth century BC and onward uh, that God is a uh, silent at that moment. He's, he, he's not directly speaking to anyone. There's no prophet, so to speak. So everything up to that point, uh, from Genesis uh, to Malachi or to Zechariah, depending on you know which order you want to uh, refer to, um, that was already closed. So we have our Hebrew canon uh, right there going up from the fourth century BC. Now, when we look at the New Testament, uh, as we talked about earlier, um, whether it's from the first century all the way down to the fourth century, you have about uh, 20 books or you have the 27 in general, they're already circulating around. So people are getting these uh, these letters, they're getting these books, they're getting the gospels. They know that they're circulating around. Um, though we may see uh, certain councils, maybe that's in 363 uh, AD, uh, they don't determine the canon. They just affirm the canon. Mm. So when we go with the, uh, the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew Bible is already canonized going back to uh, the fourth century BC. Um, and then when we look in the New Testament, as we talked about earlier, we have around 170, 180 AD that that is put as canon. Do you have some discrepancies amongst the people? Um, yes. But by and large, we already have the canon of the New Testament going back to 180 uh, AD. So you go from 180 AD and on down, we have our 66 books of the Bible. 
Yeah, and so 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 you telling me that Constantine wow, didn't man. sit there and pick which books and say, oh, oh no, I don't want this one. Throw that out. Oh, I'll take this one. Was it was it Constantine who did this? Because they'll tell you that yeah. you just gave a date of one seventy one eighty at the latest, right? I would. Constantine I would... wasn't even on the scene till the three hundreds, right? <laughs> right. So, the funny thing about Constantine, I'll, I'll say two things real quick. If 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 Constantine, you know. I bet he's rolling in his grave as much as people bring him up to starting Christianity. I mean, it's ridiculous. He's like, man, I ain't even do all that. And and I want to make a quick point, and it's not on subject, but in a sense it is. Um, when we look at Constantine and we look at Christianity, Christianity was already on the scene. Some people try to bring up the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Um, that has nothing to do with uh, bring a front uh, the canon has nothing to do about that. All that is dealing with is the deity of Christ. Everyone in the Council of Nicaea already believed in Jesus. The issue is that you have Arius teaching uh, Arianism, which believed that Jesus was created. Um, but then you have uh, Alexander of Alexandria, uh, and then you have Athanasius as well, who was the deacon at the time, where they're arguing like, no, Jesus is their creator, he is eternal. Now, why do I bring that up? Because when you go back to 313 AD, you have the Edict of Milan. Well, what is the Edict of Milan? Well, the Edict of Milan is saying, hey, look, no longer can you persecute Christians. They're equal right. footing with everybody else. So there's no way that the scriptures are created. Christianity is created by Constantine. No. How is that when he makes it legal for you to be a Christian and worship your God? So I just want to add that in. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Elder Mike, go ahead and uh, take us home with this um so the 66 books being solidified into the Bible that we have today. Just close us yes. out like you did in uh, Utah. Close us out no, like get out. <laughs> no, you the man. <laughs> you know, and Des did such an amazing job uh, breaking it down, you know, yeah. kind of giving you the history uh, behind it. And as we kind of already talked about, how we can trust what we have as scriptures, the association with the apostles, the acceptance within the New Testament church. You know, there's one thing that that we have to we have to give credence to, and that is the power of God to keep His word, and and and, and that's what and especially we as believers, we know that God is sovereign, and that He, He, uh, let, forget about man right now, He is not going to allow His word to be lost, and. As we see all, you know, we talked about the consistency of scripture, you know, throughout 1600 years, 15, 1600 years, 40 different writers, three different continents, one consistent message. We talked about the number of manuscripts and how God through non-preservation preserved and all of this. You know, we talked about all of that. Couldn't nobody do it but God. Because as you talked about the how Bar Ehrman uses the false claim of of whispering something in one person's ear, and by the time you get around the room, it's an entirely different story. Well, guess what? Jesus completely fulfills that which Isaiah said about him seven hundred years before his coming. <laughs> and and he just read Isaiah fifty three. You'll think you're reading one of the gospel accounts. Yeah. That Christ and, and, historically, yes, sir. And uh crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. Man, yes, sir, Doc. <laughs> hadn't even been invented yet. So we've got to say, could nobody do this but God? So when we say that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, God is hastening over his word to perform it. God is preserving his word. And yet he's using fallible men. And, and this is why we, we can yet be humble and thank God for what he has done when we see the variances that they push back against. That just goes to show us that in our humanity, God is still God and was yet able to preserve the truth and inerrancy of his word. I was just in a conversation actually this past Thursday where there were some people pushing back on the term inerrancy. But as you brought out, no, we're not saying that that our copies of the copies are all inerrant in, in their uh, uh, interpretation or translation, but we believe in the inerrancy of the original autographs. In other words, when God spoke through the prophets or through the apostles, that word was 
inerrant. And as they wrote, they wrote the inerrant word of God. And thank God he has preserved his word and he has kept it for us today. And if we trust in his word and we know that his word is true, at the end of the day, salvation is built on faith. But thank God that our faith is built on facts. See, some people misunderstand faith, and that's a whole nother uh, uh, story. But some people will say that faith, you know, is just grasping at straws. Uh uh. We can have faith because we have the evidence. Christ rose and showed himself to witnesses so there would be evidence of his resurrection so faith isn't something we just we just believe with no proof no the reason we can have faith in scripture is because god had preserved it through the manuscripts through the authenticity of the early church through the writings of the early church fathers through the confirmation of the apostles and so many other manuscripts and other things we can have confidence and believe god have true biblical faith in god based on the biblical evidence that he so wonderfully preserved for us Praise God. Listen, I um <laughs> I appreciate you brothers. Thank God. I just want to read a I just want to read a couple of quotes from some of the early church fathers concerning the whole issue of inerrancy. Um yeah. Clement of Rome in the 1st century said, "You have searched the scriptures which are true and given by the Holy Spirit. You know that nothing unrighteous or counterfeit is written in them." Come on. Justin man. Justin Martyr, who was a wonderful apologist in the 2nd century, he said, I am entirely convinced that no scripture contradicts another. Ooh. Tertullian, in the third century, said the statements of Holy Scripture will never contradict the truth. Mm. These are just some of the church fathers. And huh. I, was re I was reading somewhere, and I think I, I mentioned it in the la last month, that if, if someone was able to get rid of the entire New Testament, we could reconstruct the whole New Testament with the exception of 11 verses just from the quotations of the church fathers. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Ain't that something? It's powerful. God is so powerful. And, and listen, if there is a God, by definition, he has to be all powerful. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that this God is not able to keep his own word, then I don't know what kind of God you serve. Talking good. He's able to keep his word. We don't. <laughs> we'll promise something in a minute and go back on our word. But if God said it, I, I, I know I know we, we say that saying, if God said it, I believe it and that settles it. We could take that middle part out. If Come God on. said it, it's that over. settles it. It doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. If God said it, then that settles it. So, brothers, listen, I appreciate you all. Minister Dez, I'm going to let you have a few last words, and then Elder Mike, you can have a few last words, and uh, we're going to jump on off of here, and we're going to try to get back together to, to talk about how we got the various translations. You know, some people are like, well, why is there so many translations of the Bible? You got the NIV, the 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 nlt the a b c d e f g you know you got all these <laughs> versions yeah. of the bible so we're going to get together and for next month we'll talk about how we got these various versions of the bible but minister des go ahead and give us any final thoughts or final comments that you have to say and then elder mike you can have any final comments and we'll jump on off uh elder lavelle thank you for having me on uh i was looking forward to this the last couple of weeks um when you sent out the email the text message so um, thank you. Uh, Elder Mike, it's always a pleasure, as always. Um, by the way, also, just a plug in a little event. Um, we have an apologetics workshop that will be yes. um, Elder Mike. He'll be talking about uh, are we under the old or new covenant? He'll be uh, day two, I believe, day two. He'll be the first one up. So please come out. It's an e-course, Michigan. Um, if you have any, inf if you want any, any information, excuse me, um, you can find me on Facebook at Des Ingram. Uh, but just an awesome when, when, uh When is the event, Des? It's a two-day event. So uh, the first day is uh, June 18th. That is at 7 p.m. And then the second one is June 19th. That is, the second one starts at 1.30 p.m. So it kind of gives us time to, you know, kind of relax and then get forward to the next day. Absolutely. So what I want to do is if you can send me the information, I'll post it um, because this airing is going to be after that event. But I want to I want to share it on my um, other two episodes that are going to be before the event. So send me a flyer, send me something so that I can make sure the word gets out. And if it's going to be recorded, 
Um, if it'll be on your, I'm not sure if it'll be on your YouTube page or your Facebook yeah. page, but I'll if it both. is, then by, by the time uh, the audience sees this, it'll already have happened and they can go back and watch it. So I'll make sure all your information is up. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I Absolutely. definitely, I'll get that over to you tonight. Uh, but I just want everyone to know that even though we're, ha we're having these discussions about uh, the canon, it all points back to Christ. Um, everything points back to Christ. And I, I think about John 5, 39, it talks about how, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they will search the scriptures to find eternal life. But uh, Jesus tells them for it. I'm not realizing those things point to me, talk about to Jesus. And so as you have, if you're having questions about the canon of scripture, the Hebrew in the New Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament scriptures, and you realize that it is uh, what, you know, it is the 66 that is the canon. Um, hey, that just shows us how God can preserve. And if he can preserve his word, he can preserve you. I know I sound like a TBN preacher looking into the camera, uh, but nevertheless, uh, everything points to Christ. So just an awesome time. Thank you for having Amen. me. Amen. Thank you, my brother. I truly, truly appreciate you. Elder Mike. Yes, sir. Oh, wow, man, this has been amazing. I have truly been blessed and encouraged by your words, Elder Elder Lavelle and Minister Dez. Man, I, I just have enjoyed this. And I want to say, as Dez said, you know, all the scriptures point right to Christ. Yeah. Jesus came as the culmination of all the law and the prophets. Right. And, and, and his life is uh, is fully on display as the living word of God that we trust in. And so again, studying scripture is not about who knows more than who, it's about mm. who knows the who of scripture and that's mm. Jesus Christ. And so let's continue to put our faith and confidence in him. Uh, I appreciate what Elder Lavelle Neal is doing through his platform. And so I just wanna thank you all those that wanna reach out to me, you can hit me on Facebook, it's just Michael Holloway. Again, as was stated on YouTube, it's Elder Mike, your urban church. Uh, my email address is ministermike7 at yoururbanchurch.com. It's the ministry email address. Again, it's ministermike7 at yoururbanchurch.com. And, uh, you know, we would do our best to serve in any capacity we can if anyone has any questions. So God bless you. We certainly appreciate the time. Amen. Well, my brothers, I truly appreciate it. And I pray that our audience really got something out of this. Thank God for you all. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Yes, sir. Bless you, sir. Amen. 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 Listen, I don't know about you, but I truly, truly enjoyed what Elder Holloway and Minister Ingram brought to the table, how we got the Bible. This is very, very important. And listen, um, we're not going to have any shows for the month of July, but we are going to be coming back in August and we're going to keep the Defense Thursdays segment. All right. So August Defense Thursday segment, we're going to actually bring Elder Mike and Minister Dez back and we're going to talk about the various translations of the Bible. Why are there so many translations of the Bible? Which ones are reliable? Which ones are not so reliable? Which ones should we trust? Right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that to make sure, make sure, make sure that we get an understanding on that. And listen, let me say this real quick. The purpose of the Defense Thursdays is not to try to force you to believe what I believe. The purpose of Defense Thursdays is just to show you that there is information out there concerning Christianity that is good information. Because some would have you to believe that we just brainlessly, oh, we worship God or we believe the Bible. No, there is evidence. Now, do you have to accept that evidence? Absolutely not. That's your choice. But I, the purpose is just to show you that, that, that there is evidence out there that you can have that, and, 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 and it's reliable information so that you will have a basis to stand on. So we're going to keep the Defense Thursday segment. If there's any uh, apologetics topics that you all would like us to deal with or like me to deal with, please let me know. Write it on the wall. Write it on youtube or whatnot and 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 let us know or you can uh email me at kneeldownproductions1 at gmail.com that's 
Neil Down Productions, the number one at gmail.com. Let me know what topics you would like to hear and what uh, Defense Thursday's apologetics topics that you would like to see us deal with. All righty, all right. And listen, of course, you can always go to the Neil Down Productions, <clears throat> excuse me, dot com Facebook page. Click on that quarantine tab. All of our information is right there. Listen, also, if you would like to support us in any way, form, or fashion, you can definitely uh, do PayPal. Um, you can either type in at Neil Down Productions or the email address Neil Down Productions one at gmail.com. Or you can give through Cash App. Our Cash App handle is dollar sign Neil Down Pro. Dollar sign Neil Down Pro. You'll see our logo pop up. You know you're in the right area. Or you can go to kneeldownproductions.com. Click on the Donate tab. Click on the Donate tab and you can give that way. We truly, truly appreciate any and everything that you do and that you give toward us to help us better this, to make sure that everything flows smoothly and we're dealing with the topics that you want to hear. So again, we appreciate you again. Listen, this is the final episode for the first half of the season. So we will not have any new episodes for the month of July. Now I may do some, if you're watching on Facebook, I may do some, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, uh, instant replays. Uh, 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 watch party. That's what it's called. So yes, I may do a watch party. I may do one each week. I don't know, but there are five Thursdays in July. I may do that. I may not. I'm not sure, but just know that we will be back the first Thursday in August, which is August the 5th. So August the 5th, 2021, we'll be back with all new episodes. We're taking a break, not to rest, but to get things up and running to make sure that the show um, is looking good and sounding good and, and, and that we have topics that are going to bless and help you. So again, thank you all for tuning in. We truly, truly appreciate it. And listen, stay tuned. Make sure you check out the kneeldownproductions.com website. Click on that quarantine tab to stay up to date as to what we're doing. And of course, we're going to be putting commercials out just to keep you abreast on what we're doing. We truly appreciate each and every one of you. Thank God for you always supporting. Again, if you want to uh, let us know what you would like to hear about, kneeldownproductions1 at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, stay tuned, spread the word, and we'll see you on the show.